If you can find something that's really painful in the world and really difficult, that's probably a business. Business of Architecture, episode 339. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Business of Architecture is the leading business consultancy that helps you structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today I speak with Nick Granlis. Nick is a self-proclaimed recovering architect who is now the CEO of Bowerbird. Bowerbird is an online platform that makes it easy to submit your architecture to over 1,487 magazines, newspapers, and websites and counting. I'm super excited to have Nick on the show today. I've known Nick for a long time now, practically since I started my entrepreneurial journey. We both got started about the same time. As we were discussing topics to discuss for today's show, I asked Nick what topics he usually speaks about so that we can steer clear from those. I want to bring you something fresh, something you may not have heard before. Well, he said generally he speaks about how to get published uh, because Bowerbird is an online platform that helps architects do just that. If you'd like to hear about that, you can go listen to the interview that Ryan Willard did for the Business of Architecture UK podcast, where they talk about that. On today's episode, we talk about something slightly different. Nick pulls back the curtain on his own entrepreneurial journey and gives us a sneak peek, uh, including some valuable tips that you can implement in your own architectural journey. Now, early in his career, Nick took a year off to explore what successful architects were doing that helped bring them their success. He noticed they had something in common. Today, you'll discover what that thing is, as well as other lessons that Nick has learned along his entrepreneurial journey, especially from the world of startups. Nick, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Yeah. Hi, Enoch. Thank you very much for having me. Good having you. Well, let's, as we discussed before the show, let, let's start out, just tell me about your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, I guess it probably started uh, 10 years ago, like I was uh, working as an architect. And obviously being an architect, um, you know, you're creating your own businesses. So I guess you start that um, as soon as you come out of university, if you're thinking about having a practice. But for me, I shifted away from architecture uh, in about 2010. And I started to really play with a lot of different things. And so the last 10 years has been working through different ideas and trying to understand how business works better. I felt when I came out of architecture that there was something where the business of architecture could be a lot better than, uh, I guess, how it's presented to you as a student. And I was also at a time when there was a lot of change happening with technology, with social media, with websites and so forth. So that journey basically started off with me jumping on a motorbike and just riding down the coast of Australia, trying to figure out how my uh, architecture friends were practicing to sort of understand who was doing it well and who was really enjoying their life and the people who were struggling and really fighting against um, the profession. And that led me into doing architectural photography. Which I'm going to pause you for a second here, Nick. I want to get into the details a little bit there yeah, about okay. uh, about those early days, right? So, so you graduated from university, uh, went into it. Did you work as an architect for a bit? Yeah. So in my twenties, studied architecture, and then I worked for several architects, and then worked by myself, and then worked with another architect, and was sort of in that. I guess that standard architectural story where you're starting to build a practice and you could keep doing that and it was functioning, but the, I guess the, the business side of it was, it was a hard slog and it didn't look like um, it was going to change anytime soon be, just because the recipe of architecture tends to predict um, a certain outcome. And so unless you actively try and change that, I felt like I was going to get railroaded into a certain outcome. Got it. So you were on the career path, um, 
going down this road towards architecture, and then you realize there was something about the profession that didn't seem appealing in terms of the where you would end up. What was what was that probable outcome for you? What, was it was I it a think, money thing? Was it a, a satisfaction thing? Something else? I think it was a combination of both. So it was a combination of going, how do you do the projects that you want to do, but also how do you generate the income to be able to live your life? So if you're not generating much income, you're in an industry which has high risk, and at the same time, you're having to pick up jobs which you don't really want to do to be able to pay for the team and to basically feed the monster. You start to end up having a negative spiral, and eventually you get trapped in that. So you start taking on more work that you don't want to feed a team, which is getting bigger because you're trying to get to a point where you can get more projects. And at that time, because I was, you know, I was in my 20s, I didn't really understand how that worked. I didn't know how to get out of that spiral. So I basically pulled the ejector cord and said, you know, I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to go explore what architecture is to a lot of different people and see who's doing it um, in the best possible way. Uh, that's fascinating. What, what would you say your, were your insights from that year that you took off? I, I, there's some people who they treated architecture quite differently. And were, um, obviously, you see the people who are, who are happy. And you know, strangely enough, they're also the ones who are being successful. So mm-hmm. there was something linking those two things. And then there were other people who were really struggling. And again, they didn't have traction. And if you don't have traction, then you don't have enough customers. And if you don't have enough customers, you don't have the income. And so you you get trapped in that sort of cycle where you're taking on bad work. Um, it was also interesting that I guess it's location as well. So I was starting off in a tourist center. So I'm from the north of Australia. And so the population is much smaller. There's architecture work, but it's, you know, it's a very niche sort of style of work. And then once you see people working in larger centers, you start to see there's just a lot more work going on there. And some cities are booming, other cities are not. So just understanding what you, in business, you just say, you have to be in the right place. You know, uh, what do they call it? The three Ps, you know, position, position, position. Um, so the aspects of that. And also there are some people who at that time were just telling their story a lot better. I think they presented themselves to the world about what they were trying to do and essentially they were marketing themselves. And I, I didn't know any of those terms at the time, but there were some people who were just, you know, they were everywhere, they were more present, people could see their projects getting published. And do, do, you, do, you they, think that they, do you think that they th- thought about themselves as marketing or do you think that it was more something where they, uh, perhaps it just became naturally to them and, and, and uh, it was effective marketing or something else? Uh, yeah, I think in 2010, marketing within architecture was still a dirty word. It was still this concept where, you know, traditionally we were coming from, um, in many places, uh, this idea that architects don't advertise because that's not professional. And, you know, some countries that may have even been illegal. Um, so some people were dabbling with it. And then I think a few people, whether they knew it or not, they were getting the advantages of marketing. So, for example, if you're being picked up by an editor in a big architecture magazine, at the time, people were probably telling themselves, well, I'm just doing amazing work. And that was always the the line, like, I just do amazing work. I'm not marketing myself. In reality, that's all marketing. Essentially, it's telling your story. You're getting out to the world. You just happen to be, you know, you are doing good work, but somebody else is doing the marketing for you. And then from about 2010, I think that started to shift. And that was because we had things like social media. And now you see things like Instagram where, you know, if you're not putting yourself out on Instagram, you're probably, you know, probably falling behind the pack as everyone else is really marketing themselves on a daily basis. Fantastic. So these, as you, as you took this journey, these practice owners, you could see some of them were, some of them were happy and successful. Some of them were we're not as pleased, and uh, you notice that there was this consistency of telling their story and getting there, being everywhere, kind of getting out there. Yeah, getting basically having a successful business. Yeah, and that's yeah. I think if you have an unsuccessful business, then of course it's going to be really hard because you're starving and you don't have any, you basically don't have excess resources to grow your business. Which is you know we talk about profit, but profit is actually the ability to actually do more things as well. So. If you don't have any profit in your business, you can't hire that extra person to, you know, do that next step of whatever it is you're trying to do. So once you have a 
you know, positive um, forward trajectory. You get to do bigger and better things. You also get to filter the clients that come through your door. You know, if you have too many clients coming through, you get to pick the best ones. So it's not just about trying to grow and become bigger. It's really about trying to do more of the things that you really want to do. So good business can actually give you, you know, more of the focus on you know, your passion and your interests and you know, creating a life that you really want to create. Brilliant. So what I hear is from you is that one of your key lessons from this uh, sabbatical, as it were, that you took yeah. uh, was just understanding the importance of client acquisition and, and really seeing the practices that were doing it well versus the ones that weren't. Yeah, that was part of it. it absolutely. And um, yeah, client acquisition and I guess it's the way they were approaching the, the projects as well. Like yeah, some tell people, me about that. Um, well, I guess the, the person that comes to mind is I've got a friend in Noosa, uh, Jolyon Robinson. He's made himself a superstar on Instagram now and does a lot of, I guess, um, I guess holiday home style um, design. So he's in a beautiful beach location. It's just outside, probably two hours away from the capital city. And for him, he now gets clients from all over the world. And so the clients are flying in because they want to stay somewhere amazing. But he's finding people in China, um, in Pakistan, all over the place who want that style of work. And so the way, the way he's working is he's often far more relaxed about the whole process. He's got a, himself a little cottage. You know, it's an old, what we call a Queenslander. It's just a style of building in Queensland. It's a timber cottage from about, you know, maybe the 1920s. And his lifestyle is not about having a massive firm with 50 people. It's really about having these clients who are coming into that region. And the way he works with builders is far more relaxed. So again, it's not about max maxing out all the documentation necessarily. It's about using those trades and those skills to solve problems. And it's just interesting to watch how different people work. And um, compare, compared to Let's say you're in a big city and suddenly you've got 50 staff and you've got a huge you know, mortgage to pay, you know, a huge loan to pay all your staff every week and you have a lot of risk with that sort of business. So it was just interesting watching those different sort of people work. Yeah, any other insights that you had from that uh, free time on the open road? Not, not when I was doing it then. I, I think my general insight was that I was still searching for what was missing. Like now that I've gone through building businesses many times, I think the biggest thing is figuring out why you're valuable to people. So trying to understand what problem you're really trying to solve and whether or not people are willing to exchange money for you to solve that problem, which is very much a startup mentality. So once you get into startups, you you really are looking for problems and often people think about technology as, you know, it's a solution to all of these things, but that principle works for any business. So unless you've got a real problem that you're solving, you don't really have a business. And so I feel like architects can trap themselves in their passion projects. Whereas if you start from the other direction and start to go, what is it that I'm really trying to solve here? Do people want to exchange money for it? If you can find that overlap, you suddenly find yourself probably a business that you can grow and expand. And what were some of the other businesses that you uh, that you started or ventures that you did along the way uh, so I started off I started off with photography so again this was a, a passion project for me Start, started off as a creative outlet from architecture where mm. you know I was able to create something and I didn't have a client and I didn't have um, it was instant gratification so unlike architecture where you feel like often you're battling with a client and you're trying to create one thing and you know the outcome could be disappointing, photography allowed me to create something where I could just go and create that freely and feel at the end of the day, like here's something I've actually done. So I did that and transitioned that into a business which was architectural photography. So again, I didn't want to go too far from where I'd started in architecture. So I came back to architecture started taking photos and then turned that into a, a business um, to do that. And that sort of led me into the technology world because at the time, in around 2010, photographers were kind of at the forefront of social media because images, they just get shared very easily and they're very powerful online. So photographers were sharing a lot 
they were blogging, they, were, they had YouTube channels and they were teaching each other how they all did their work. And they sort of had cracked this sort of um, what I call a professional bubble where nobody talks about what they do because they're scared that everyone else is going to um, steal their ideas or it's, you know, professional um, sort of lockdown in a way. And so they started sharing all this information and that triggered this whole sort of process of going, okay, there's, there's a lot changing in the world and there's a lot of opportunity there. So that led to a range of projects. So I started blogging. So I needed to build up a profile in photography. So I started blogging as I was learning how to photograph. And that was to build up an audience. And I did the same thing with Twitter. So I started to share what I was doing. And I was building up a public brand or a, a personal brand and making that very public and basically just sharing all this stuff, um, all this knowledge, which really hadn't been written down and it hadn't been shared anywhere publicly. So the only way you could really learn to do architectural photography was by being an apprentice. Or there was a handful of books, but they just weren't very well written. And as this was all evolving, you know, you've, you're looking for knowledge, and there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of podcasts, you know, like this one as well, where you can hear people's stories and what they did and how they trialed things. So I became fascinated by all of these things and dabbled with a, a range of projects and then went to, I think when we first met, I was playing with a project called Websites for Architects. Brilliant. And I mean, just a brilliant little mini niche website. Tell us about that. I think it's still up, isn't it, Nick? I think it, technically it's still up. I haven't looked at it for a long time. Okay. But, um, Do you get any uh, commission or affiliate sales from that website still? Do you know? Uh, no, nothing like that. I, I, it links back to everything else I do now, but I, I left it up there, even though it's getting a little bit out of date. But mm -hmm. basically what it was, was I sat down for a week and I wrote basically a brain dump of what I'd learned about websites, architects, personal brand, and this idea that if you're an architect and you tell a, a genuine story about who you are and what you want to do, um, that's how you build a very powerful website. And especially if you, because the problem was architects had been building websites probably during the 2000s and they were trying to be very creative, but you ended up with these crazy websites which really didn't do anything. So you ended up with... It was the days of Flash where you'd go to a website and you'd have moving balls around the page and you had to chase them and suddenly it would open up a project and you didn't really know, like, what on earth am I meant to do here? And so it was really bringing these ideas from, I guess, you know, photography and these other places online and saying, architects, there's a lot to learn about websites. You know, it's not that hard. You just need to tell a good story and you need to understand why you're doing it. You know, you're trying to find people who want to do projects with you. And just rearranging that into simple to follow steps and to basically make it open and free and public. So that was just a very tiny project, but it was connected up with Google and search terms and a whole range of things. So it just had a lot of traffic and it just naturally worked. So these are all the little learnings that you have as you build towards like building a much bigger startup, sort of like a stair, stair step approach where you, you just learned that, oh, you know, there was 10,000 people every month searching for that term for websites for architects. So there's a, there's a desire there. People are looking for that information. It just wasn't there. And so that project was there. The, but for me personally, I didn't want to build websites all my life. I didn't want to go into that sort of business. So it was really an experiment. And that's what led to Bowerbird, which was sort of a combination of uh, coming out of photography, wanting to know how to get published, and then combining that with a technology solution to say, okay, I'm trying to figure out how this thing, how this publishing world works. There's a lot of publications in the world now because, you know, for the last 10 years, everyone's been releasing a new blog or a new website to display uh, photos of buildings. But how do I find the editors? How do I get it to the editors? And so that sort of led to Bowerbird and, and what I do now. And what is Bower Bird? Give me the give me the story behind the name. Uh, well, I, I'm the bad co-founder for this because I just say we found a domain name which was available, um, which had two Bs in it. I just liked it. But Ben has a much better story. He's the other co-founder and he's the journalist in the team. But he likes to talk about a Bower Bird is an Australian bird and they build these nests which are called Bowers. And what they do is they collect blue things. And I think it's to attract mates. So you see these nests and they're sort of a round nest with all these blue things. 
And so he looked at it a bit like he's collecting stories. So as a journalist, he's looking for architecture to you know, put into a magazine. And so he's constantly making lists of different projects. So let's say you're doing a story on timber um, high rises. Well, you collect a whole range of projects and so forth. So it made a lot of sense for him. It connected with um, how he worked. But, um, but the, the app itself is really, it allows architects to upload content to build media kits uh, for their work. And then it plugs into a, it's basically a, an ecosystem of journalists and architects who are exchanging content. So it allows you to say, hey, I want to send my project to the New York Times. I can just send it off to them. Hey, I want to send it to Arc Daily. And off it goes. And it just simplifies that whole media process. Yeah. So, so help me understand. So for a flat fee, uh, just to tell our audience about Bowerbird, yeah. they get access to um, basically a tool which helps them yeah. syndicate. Is that the right word or how, how would you yeah. guys put it? Yeah, so basically um, you're trying to get your work into the hands of journalists and journalists are trying to get, they're trying to find your work. And that sounds relatively easy, but it's actually quite hard because the journalists don't know your buildings exist. So especially because it's international, they don't know that on the other side of the world, you just finished a project unless you tell them. At the same time, it's hard for the architect because you're dealing with potentially 100, maybe 200 journalists, you know, all over the world who want content and going back and forth. So it's a platform which just manages all that for you, allows you to upload your content and just make, allows you to get out to as many people as efficiently as possible in, in both directions. So you, the journalists aren't wasting their time, the architects aren't wasting their time. And at the end of the day, you're telling your story to the greatest possible audience. Now, I remember that when you started out, and I'm not quite sure if this is still the case, but you were very selective about the the architects that you let come on the platform, or you were looking for very certain kind of work or certain certain level or caliber. Tell me about that. What was the reason behind that, and why is that important in a business sense? Tell me. It still is. So, so what we have now is we basically we have a team of people all over the world in different regions who essentially their job is to search for architecture. But the other job is that basically they're a filter to um, filter that content before it gets to the journalists, because ultimately that's what journalists are doing anyway. So we're trying to make their life easier. So if you're a journalist, you get bombarded with 100 emails a day from different people with projects that don't match their publication. So if you're, you know, if you're a housing magazine and somebody's pitching you a restaurant, you're just wasting somebody's time. It's, it's noise. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to essentially match make and try to simplify that as best as possible. So that's why there's a filtering process in there. And really all it is is it's going, look, there's a, a certain number of slots that these magazines um, have. There's This is the content they're looking for. And if we can f match those two, then we let somebody in. Yeah. And what would be, if we looked at that from a business sense and we said, okay, here, what's the business yeah. lesson here behind that strategy? What, what would you say? Uh, I would say this is part of managing marketplaces. So this is more of a tech startup sort of conversation, probably not so applicable to architects, but essentially what Bowerbird is is a marketplace. And so a marketplace has two sides. You have generally a marketplace, you have somebody who's creating something and somebody who's consuming it. And when you're running a marketplace, you have to make sure it's a fine balance to make sure it works. So, for example, if you had too many junky projects in there, the marketplace value for the other side drops. So you're trying to maintain that value. So that's that's part of why that happens. And unless you can figure out a way of self-filtering or um, somehow managing that marketplace in a different way, the easiest way we found was basically just to look at the projects and to go, we think that'll get published. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it, it reminds me of like another marketplace would be Google, right? I mean, yeah. Google has, they, they try to make sure that from the end user who's searching, that yeah. the, the results are relevant, right? If they just churned up any old blog that had tons of keywords in it, well, people might stop using it. So it sounds like same thing for you guys, similar. Yeah, and it's a, yeah, it's a bit like if, you, if you're an architect and your phone was ringing every day with people who didn't fit your style of architecture, you would find it's a waste of your time. It's yeah. actually becoming a burden to you. So 
if you're trying to find those customers, what you're really trying to do is filter them so that you can get the best ones, so that you can you can give your time to somebody that you're actually going to work with rather than somebody who you're not. Okay. Well, let's let's talk startups. Let's yeah. talk. What what are some of the lessons that you've learned, and especially that might be applicable for our audience now that you've been through this journey uh, to where you are now? Looking back, what what techniques, advice, <laughs> tips would you give? Yeah, I think the, the big thing to understand is when people think of startups, what they're thinking generally of is things like technology, Google, these big change things. Whereas the underneath that, there's a what's called like a startup process. Like there's a lot of foundational thought that's gone into that. And essentially, that's a strategy for solving problems, um, especially big problems that have risk and trying to minimize that risk. So I think that's a big element that architects can take away from this. So the main process that's used is what's called the Lean Startup process. And this is from a guy called Eric Rees. He wrote the book, The Lean Startup. And what it basically is, is a three-step process. It's saying you have an idea, you want to test that idea as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible, and you want to know if your idea is valid or invalid. That's all it is. So you imagine you're in the startup world, somebody comes to Silicon Valley and says, I've got the next big idea. You know. I'm going to deliver food on horseback, you know, whatever it is. You know, you think people come up with crazy ideas. And you go, okay, that's great. Um, before you go and buy a stable and before you start, you know, spending millions of dollars on horses, how do you test that idea in the simplest possible way? And maybe that's as simple as, you know, hiring a horse for a day and seeing if people like, you know, what's the logistics here? You may find a horse just can't get around the city as well. And what you're trying to do here is you're trying to either kill the idea as quickly as possible or you're trying to you're trying to get a signal that says this is positive. Now the reason that's really useful is because you can apply that principle to a heap of small things in your business. So you don't have to be the next Google to do this. We find that in almost every decision we make now, we use something where we so Ben and I will be having a conversation, one of us will go, hey oh, shouldn't we do this? Wouldn't it be great if we, you know, hypothetically, let's say, let's make our website yellow. Um, it could be anything. And the other person will say, well, what's your hypothesis here? Like, what are you really trying to do? And when you, when you force yourself into that, you go, well, I guess I was changing it to yellow because I thought more people would register on the website. So it forces you to be very measured in what you're doing. And when you go through that process, you often realize that you're probably applying a lot of time to things which won't move your business forward. You're just sort of playing around the edges or you're playing with something which may interest you. It just doesn't have an effect for your business. So that process is incredibly powerful. Nick, I mean, that, that's it's such a deep and powerful principle. Like you said, I mean, my mind is spinning here. Yeah. But um, just the idea about what to focus on. Right, because taking that idea, if if we're focusing on the wrong, so what I'm hearing is that uh, the focus is everything, right? But the way you get to the right focus is through the lean startup methodology of testing quickly, iterating, finding what sticks, focusing on the right thing. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So that little process will help you think through something. So, um, you know, as an architect, let's say you're saying I want to. I want to pay $10,000 to be in the newspaper, which is great, okay? Maybe somebody wants to do that. Now you're thinking, well, what will the, what do I think the effect will be? And then how do I measure that? So is there a way to, to measure that? And if there isn't a way to measure it, it's probably a sign that you either haven't thought about it well enough or the, what you're about to do is just a completely unknown. Um, and at that point, you have a high risk. So the more money you're spending on something with the higher risk, you, you're really just rolling a dice. And that's what most people do with businesses. They have an idea, they're, just, they're gonna dedicate years of their life to it, and then they get to the other side of it and they realize it doesn't do what they think it was gonna do. So what you're trying to do is, you're, you're trying to basically kill that idea as quickly as possible. Like If you can kill that idea in one day, that's, that's a move forward. Because you've just saved yourself two years of toil. Mm. Um, and you continue that process and you continue that process and it just forces you to constantly be working on something that's going to move your business forward. Like Something we talk about a lot is 
what's the one thing I can do today to move the business forward? I only have to do one thing. I don't need to be busy. What I need to do is I need to do that one thing. If I do that one thing, then I do. if I wake up every day and do one thing, and it's the right thing, you're going to get traction. You're going to go in the right direction, um, as opposed to the other one, which is you're basically spending years going in the wrong direction. Yeah, Nick, and before we before we started rolling here, uh, we were having a conversation about your duties at Bowerbird, and you talked about how you're currently the CEO. And I said, well, what, what do you generally do? And you said, I cast the vision. I think about where we're going, right? I kind of yeah. look at the strategies, look at the big picture, look to see what are those big levers that we need to be moving. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're trying to see what will change in the next couple of years. And you know, as, a, as an architect, what that may be is you're trying to figure out what will be in demand. And you know, a lot of large firms do this already, where they're going, we think aged care is going to be hugely in demand. And you're trying to figure out what that is. Um, an interesting point with that whole startup process, which I really like, is this idea of problem solving. And a big tip I'd give to architects is this question, which is, look for the biggest pain point. So what I mean by that is, if you can find something that's really painful in the world and really difficult, that's probably a business. And the more difficult it is and the more painful it is, the more valuable it is. And if there's no pain point, then there isn't really a business there. So one of the, the way you use this, and this is sort of a way of finding those ideas of what you're going to focus on. But um, an example might be if you're an architect and you work in schools, what you do is you go talk to the principals of those schools, get a list of 20 of them, organize a heap of meetings, and just ask some questions about what's the worst part of working with architects? Like what's the hardest part? And you don't know what you're going to find, but if you find something in there that you're interested in, then you may have a little bit of like a secret recipe that you can now incorporate into your business. So, you know, the teachers may tell you that the hardest part is actually working with a big group of people on a large school. And so they're not telling you that they want a certain design outcome. What they're saying is we have trouble working as a team or to get decisions from a team. And that's the indicator to go, that's painful, and potentially that's something that people will exchange money for to solve. And as soon as you find that, then you know that you're actually solving a real problem, and then you can keep focusing on that. And that's, again, why I think like startup methodology is incredibly powerful, because it forces you to hone in on real problems that people are facing. What other lessons from the startup world or from your personal experience uh, come to mind? I mean, we've touched upon the lean startup methodology, identifying a problem, finding a big pain? Um, so you, you have those three steps. So you, you've got that first one, which is identifying problems. So we sort of went over that. The second one is this testing phase. And this is in the startup world, this is what we call a minimum viable product. So it's an MVP. So if you hear that term being thrown around the startup world, what it is is you're saying, how can I test that idea as quickly as possible? And there's a whole range of ways of doing that. But, you, for example, let's say you've got a creative idea and, I don't know, maybe you want to do cardboard architecture, you know, just throwing something out there. What you're trying to figure out is if people actually want that. So what's the fastest way you can do that? Maybe it is doing renderings and putting it on Instagram and seeing if anybody likes it. Now, if, you get a, if that goes viral and people really like it, that's a signal that there, there may be something there. It doesn't mean it's everything, it's just a signal. And then you build up on that signal. So what you're trying to look for is, sure, it's popular, people share it, but will people exchange money for it? So maybe then you need to do a rendering, have a website, and say, contact us to build your cardboard house. And you're trying to figure out if anybody actually clicks through there. And again, that's a minimum viable product. It's so small. So for as an example, in Bowerbird, our minimum viable product was a PDF. We, um, we started off, we went and talked to a lot of journalists, we asked some questions about what's the most painful thing that you have dealing with architects, and they were telling us the difficult stuff is going back and forth with them, they don't come to us with a package of content, uh, it takes us months to get a story, but if you turn up to uh, a journalist with a package, which is essentially what a media kit is, where you've already answered their questions, you've got the photos done, 
your chances of getting published are much, much higher. So that was the pain point. And then we created a PDF. And the PDF is the, this is the simplest way to test this idea. So at the time I was a photographer, so I've got access to photos and projects. So I put that into the minimum viable product, send it off to a journalist and see if it gets published. And that worked. So there's your positive signal. So then you start to build that up and see if it's actually valuable to other people and on you go. Brilliant. And what I love about the Bowerbird model in this conversation is that yeah. you're actually, you're pairing up two pains, right? Because you said it's a marketplace. So you're finding the pain on the journalist side and then you're also solving something for the architects. Absolutely. So you're going from two directions. Yeah. And if you can, and what's also interesting with that, so here's the other big insight with all of this is what you think is the pain point may not actually be the pain point. Ooh, so that's, it, this, is, this is good. I, I want to hear what's next. Yeah. This is a good. Okay. So um, you have to be really humble when you're using the startup methodology because it will constantly prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. So you will constantly think something should be better. And then when you test it, it tells you something the opposite. Um, a classic example in startups would be emails. So, you know, if you talk to a, an architect or a designer and you ask them, what do you think is going to be better? Like a plain text email or a beautiful HTML email with beautiful graphics, the perfect font, everything is formatted. Well, it turns out the plain text email is better. And, you know, as a designer, you probably go, yeah, but the other one's more beautiful. It's better. Yeah, from a and marketing it, perspective, right? Or getting opened or responded to, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you're, you're measuring something where you're going, how many people actually click over to your website to see what you actually do? And it turns out that the plain text is, um, has a higher click-through rate because it has higher trust. And the beautiful one looks like somebody spent too much time on it. And so people see it as potential spam or a sales email. So... You, as you go through all these tests, this will constantly shock you what is valuable to people or what people are really looking for. Um, and architects could start to do this with their customers as well. Like even just having a cursory look at things like Pinterest or, um, or Instagram and seeing what, why are people following something? What, what's, what's piquing their interest? It's amazing how like kitchens, kitchens uh, have a huge number of people who follow them and i wouldn't think of you know obviously kitchens are an integral part of your design but once you realize that there is a massive stream of people looking at kitchens you may be able to use that as a place to actually find people to work with and then build upon it to say look i'm designing your entire house that's great but maybe the entry point to that is your kitchen and again i could be wrong about that it's just a hypothesis so yeah. then you would have to go test that and what happens if you put a kitchen on your the homepage of your website? Does that actually help you find more customers or less? And yeah, it could find you the wrong one. It could find you people who don't want to do the full house and therefore you've learned something. And you just, again, it's this constant learning and trying to measure something to see um, how is the world actually working, not how you think it's going to work. One thing that's that's required amidst all this, of course, is having having what I call the space, Nick. So actually having the space or the thought space in your mind to be able to sit back, you know, get out on the porch, have a sip of coffee or your tea or whatever, and just think about the business strategically and and proactively. Now, one thing in my work that I've seen with architects of being a service-based profession is many times they're so down in delivering the work answering phone calls, answering emails, that they just get trapped. It's difficult to step away and be in the CEO role like you are now, being yeah. able to have that vision, yeah. being able to think strategically about the business. What advice would you have for architects to be able to, uh, to create that space for themselves that can lead to some powerful things? I, I think it's about designing processes, not buildings. So design the process. So if you're trying to get a certain design outcome, rather than you thinking, I'm the only one that can do this and you know I'm this creative genius and something will just pop up and so forth, think about it as you're trying to create a process that solves a problem. So again, there's lots of little problems that you, as an architect, that you work through. That could be things like um, you're dealing with a whole range of town planning overlays on a site. Okay, so you don't need to be involved with that. 
what you need to design is a process which gives you a reliable outcome over and over. Um, once you do that, you can now get somebody else in your office to do that and reduce your risk from stepping away from it. And if you can continue to do that on every small part, then you are actually you're able to remove yourself from, I guess, all, all that grunt work, all of the work where you're pulling you know, the entire business yourself. And essentially what's happening is you're starting to automate it. So that process doesn't need to be human driven. It could just be technology driven. You're trying to find a way that makes it more efficient. And of course, you're combining that with the income that's coming in. So if you can maintain that same income, but now that's automated or more efficient, then your revenues are going up, but it's also freeing up your space. And it's only once you free up that space that allows you to go on to the next thing. That's that's the big thing I've learned. So, so for me personally, I'm the guy who came out of architecture. I want to do everything myself. I coded the whole platform. I was marketing the platform, selling the platform. And so it takes a lot for an architect to let go of that and to step away from it and let somebody else help you. And what you learn over time is that people can actually do things better than you can. And it's actually important for you to let go. Like if you believe in the business and what you're doing, you sometimes have to let other people do it. And mm. now your job is what you're actually doing is you're looking at the process to see how you tweak that to say, if I change this in a process, does the outcome change at the end of it? Nick, we could we could be here all day chatting. I mean, I love yeah. talking about this stuff, and I know you too, do yeah. too. Um, yeah. Is is there any any key business lesson uh, that you've had from your experience that you think that we've left out? And I'm not saying there needs to be, but is there anything that comes to mind? The only, I mean, just following on from that that uh, line of thinking is probably books like um, E Myth Revisited. Um, it's an old business book, but it's all about processes. Yeah. So that's probably. Uh, the big one there and probably the lean startup. I think that will give some people an idea of, of those things. And just, yeah, one last one would be it's the, um, the danger of perfection. Mm. And this is a big one for architects. Mm. So when you, the lean startup is the opposite of um, perfect being first. So what architects tend to do is they want to lock themselves in the attic they want to be a creative genius and then they want to open up the door in two years and come out with this perfect thing. Um, that's essentially what the startup methodology is trying to get rid of because that's high risk and it has a really high failure rate. Um, and the big one with it is you're just really not getting feedback. You're not getting any feedback along the way. So moving away from this idea that you just create perfection the first time up to going the road to perfection is actually iteration. So it's going to take you many small steps. And as long as you're constantly improving those steps, the outcome gets better and better and better. And that's how you end up with, you know, you end up with an iPhone, which, you know, 10 years on is this amazing device. It didn't come out freshly baked like it is today. It took a long way to get there. Brilliant. Well, Nick. Granlis is co-founder of Bowerbird.io. You can go find out more by visiting the website. And Nick, thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me. Anytime. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.